Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalist, a resource for trade union activists and organisers. My name is Chris. I'm a member of the Industrial Workers of the World and also a lay official with the National Education Union. I work as a teacher in Workshop. Uh, we are joined today by Ed. Hello. If you'd like to introduce what you do, Ed, or um, any organising you've been involved in. Yeah, um, I'm a member of the IWW and um, also the UCU. Um, I'm a PhD student. Great stuff. Um, also joined by our regular members of the editorial team, Dave. Yeah, I'm Dave. I'm a official for the National Education Union and I'm also a Unite activist. And Lydia. Um, I'm a member of the IWW in London. First of all, we're going to start off with a bit of an introduction about what UBI is. And I did think it was something to do with a urinary tract infection, but it turns out it's not, <laughs> not that. So if you want to first tell us what UBI stands for and what it is. So, you know, first of all, plenty of cranberry juice. Keep <laughs> um, but I mean, UBI is very, very broadly defined. So the broadest definition is that it's a sum of money paid to every individual, regardless of employment or um, employment status or income. But that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So the Basic Income Earth Network have a specific definition, and that's cash paid at regular intervals to all individuals unconditionally. But out of that, there are lots of different questions that arise. So how regular is this payment? What is the payment level? Is it to satisfy all basic needs or just some? How is this scheme funded? Is it the state? Is it a private company? Is it a charity? And what are the conditions? Do you have to be a citizen? Do you have to reside in a particular locality? Do you have to have particular needs? Um, and also, how does it run alongside existing welfare systems? So what UBI is, is a, a patchwork of different things that can mean very different things to very different people from across the political spectrum. Which of, what does it stand for? Universal basic <laughs> income. Awesome. Thanks for that. So um, what, why, why do you think, also to kind of clarify why we're talking about this now, why do you think people are talking more, why do you think there's a popularity of UBI mm. in the news media for commentators and, and elements of the left right now? Yeah, so the first sort of big um, idea for UBI as a solution is that it, it can be seen as a way to address poverty, inequality and in inadequate social protection. So where welfare systems are not working as they should. The other idea is that it can help mitigate the impacts of automation. Um, and a lot of progressive uh, proponents of UBI argue that it's a way of radically transforming the link between workers and the state. Um, um, I guess one of the important things is when we're trying to understand what it is, is the impact it has on the society. Because obviously, you know, in this country, we live in a welfare state in, in the various different forms that it is. Um, and obviously a lot of us on the left spend a lot of our time defending the welfare state for one reason or another. Um, but when you're looking at UBI, do you see it as something that the ideas behind it are about creating a more equal society and its impact does it create a more equal society? Yeah, so this is actually quite a complex question and it's very much based on, you know, if it were policy, what would it look like? So. If UBI, for example, was sufficient to meet all of our needs, then it would probably make society more equal. However, if you think about it in terms of practical implementation and how feasible it is from a sort of policy perspective, it's a lot more complex. Mm -hmm. So um, there's one academic, Luke Martinelli, who does like these simulations for what it would look like. And he finds that if UBI for Britain, and he stimulates it for Britain, he says that if UBI was sufficient to meet all basic needs, then it would cost a lot more than the existing welfare state. And actually, the um, distributional impacts would be less positive. So what would happen is that because um, UBI would be paid to absolutely everyone, people in the middle classes would benefit more and it would be more expensive. So, for example, a UBI in that sense wouldn't necessarily pay extra for people with additional needs. Let's say if you've got a disability, it doesn't address um, structural issues within 
the economy, let's say institutional racism, mm. for example. Um, so in that sense, it would make society less equal. Um, so he then goes on to say, well, okay, let's think about a different way to do it and say, well, we'll keep some means tested benefits, let's say for those who have young children or let's say for those with disabilities, let's keep some of those and have a UBI that more or less maps onto um, what job seekers allowance would be. Mm. And there he finds that, okay, cool, like there are some more positive aspects, but again, because you're paying the richest people in society as well, you're not actually drastically reducing inequality. And he finds that actually under this, child uh, child poverty would actually increase. Yeah. So basically, um, the middle classes would benefit the most. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is one of the things that I really struggle with. And I, I know we don't want to jump straight into criticism too much, but where this where you would actually see an impact of it i guess because and where the difference is between because what i'd what i'd really like to get out of here is a bit where why is this different from a normal welfare system what's what's the difference between this and a normal welfare system um because some of the models you that I, you know looking at in preparation for today where it was saying oh everyone gets say looking at an American model, everyone gets a thousand dollars. Everyone just gets a thousand dollars and they get that regardless of anything else. Everyone gets that fixed. So everyone gets brought above the poverty. Yeah, and not like, tied to a willingness yeah. to find work or yeah. do work or do anything really. Yeah. 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 And part of the issue with that, I think is that point that you're pointing to there is that actually, of course, people who are wealthier, they're going to, they're, they're going to pocket that. That's going to go into savings because as we all know, you know, all the research shows that for every pound you give someone on a low income, they're going to spend one pound fifty. For every pound you give to someone on a high income, they're going to spend fifty p. You know, it's it it it's just it's it's the way that it's the way that welfare is calculated basically yeah. on that, how that impacts. So so why 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 do supporters of and sorry I know you no no not to like pin you down for it or anything, but like why do you think that supporters of UBI somehow see this as any different from another welfare system yeah so i think so to two points from that so the first point that you made about um you know those with greater wealth saving for example there's really good evidence to back that up so alaska um pays people um money each year from oil gains mm. and actually the academic research that's been done on that has found that um indigenous people don't actually gain much from the payment and nor do the poorest people in Alaskan society because it means that people are saying using their payment to buy winter winter coats yeah. or to buy food whereas those with um, greater capital to begin with mm. are investing that money into university tuition fees or putting it into savings or using it to buy property but to address that point of why it is desirable so the fundamental thing I think that draws a lot of people is that first of all it eliminates the stigma of receiving welfare i mean we know from i mean you just have to look at the front cover of any terrible newspaper yeah. that there is a huge amount of stigma attached with those in receipt of any form of welfare benefit and a universal basic income model eliminates that stigma because it's paid to absolutely everyone um so first of all it's sort of destigmatizes welfare. The second argument is that at the moment, given the shift in the global economy, um, sort of mid-century ideas about the welfare state system aren't working as well. So it's about thinking of different ways to do welfare. Um, obviously, there are lots of different ways to view that, but that is one solution to a broken or changing welfare system. Is that, do you feel that those are practical problems or political problems like is it that the neoliberals are attacking welfare as a concept or are we actually encountering real concrete demographic issues with it with administering welfare i think um it's a bit of both i would say that for me personally and i think this is viewed differently by different people the political is far more important in terms of the shift 
in the sort of neoliberal welfare model that we see now. But that point about administration is really interesting. We do in Britain today have a very complex welfare system. So the argument for UBI is that, well, actually, it eliminates the complexity um, of the welfare system. You no longer need to be doing means testing. You no longer need to be assessing people. But then again, you come back to the question of if you do have specific additional needs, mm -hmm let's say you um, need extra support because of a disability, mm -hmm. to what extent is the UBI going to be enough? And mm -hmm. will you need to introduce um, a means tested or a needs tested system anyway? Yeah, because I guess it's the thing, isn't it? Is, is it? is it really that bad to be assessing people's needs and, and helping them out based on how much they need help? You know, it, is that necessarily a bad thing? And I, I, and I guess it's, it's really interesting hearing some of those arguments about UBI. And I know obviously you're talking about sort of general points that are made about it because they sound insanely close to the arguments that are made for things like universal credit. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 the, the arguments are very similar. And, and, and for people who don't know what universal credit is, it's a new welfare system here in the UK, which is being trumpeted as a way to simplify uh, a welfare system so that you just get one payment a month and you know that covers all of your benefits in one go um, but it's yeah it's also been as used as a way to cut people's benefits quite I've got a good anecdote about oh um, <laughs> the universal <laughs> credit that I know someone who works for the citizens advice bureau which is a charity here in the UK which helps people access welfare and before universal credit was even rolled out they were having to employ extra support workers to help people access universal credit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. a system that was meant to simplify welfare and make it easier to access now requires additional resources yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to I mean, access. Yeah, yeah. We could have like a whole separate discussion <laughs> yeah. on how utterly ridiculous universal credit is. Yeah. But coming back to the thing about UBI, so what I said earlier is that UBI means different things to different people. Yeah. There are a million different mm. ways to conceive of it and argue for ways to implement yeah. it. And actually, universal credit is very, very similar mm. to lots of proposed models of UBI. Yeah. There's really not that much of a difference in UBI and universal credit. So yeah. um, it's most similar to a model of UBI called the negative income tax model. And the negative income tax model is a tapered system where the amount of monthly payment you get yeah. Um, goes down as your income increases. Okay. And it was trialled in the US in a couple of different states in the 1970s. Um, and actually, universal credit mm -hmm. is basically just that. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And what's really interesting is that when it was trialled in the US, it was trialled at the time of our friend Reagan. <laughs> so you can see a lot of the sort of political um, ideas that inform it, that inform it there, like, there isn't a focus, in my opinion, on those who are most marginalised mm. in society. Yeah. And I guess we'll come on to stuff about what universality means anyway. But yeah, those yeah. are yeah. some of those thoughts. I guess, I guess kind of following on from the impact it has on people in society generally. I mean, what does what, what you've studied as, as, as part of looking at UBI, how has that affect, how has that had an impact on things like gender equality you know what what kind of impact does that does a system like UBI have I know you've sort of alluded to it already but if you want to go into that yeah in so um so UBI could in theory reduce gender inequality because it for example can be seen as similar to the wages for housework arguments mm. because then people who are not active in the labour market receive some sort of payment and that can be seen as a way to support usually women doing care work within the home but it can also have negative consequences so it can entrench the idea that care work is women's work mm. um, and actually in different trials what's happened is particularly in a trial in the 70s in Canada what happened was women left work mm. um, and women left work so they could care because there was this extra payment coming in so they didn't need to seek paid employment to the same level so this actually brings us to the question of well who does care work you know 
is care work something that should be provided within um, individual families um, or by individuals for other individuals or is it a social issue mm -hmm. and I think here there's that question of well how do we see gender issues are they individual problems or are they social mm -hmm. problems I obviously argue that they're social problems mm -hmm. so rather than being a sort of cognate of wages for housework it's a question of well would it not be better to invest that money in socialising care. Um, I think that would be more mm -hmm. emancipatory. But then the contrast is that, um, so that in, a trial, in a trial in India, um, which was supported by a trade union, the Self-Employed Women's Association, what happened is that women's trade union involvement increased and um, women's household decision-making power increased. So that's super mm -hmm. interesting. But I think, again, this comes back to a question of, where UBI is implemented and how UBI is implemented. So when it was trialled in India, it was in quite small villages with very little infrastructure, um, very little access to um, normal means of accessing social welfare. And so that little bit of money led to a, a significant gain in terms of empowerment, simply in terms of securing basic needs. But I think UBI is something that's very, very context specific. Um, and in the British case, for example, I would argue that in terms of gendered um, equality, thinking about women's work and care work, it would be better to have mm. a social model of care where the whole of society takes the responsibility. Yeah, because it would be it would be interesting to think about what might happen for waged care work in that situation, like if people are leaving like leaving the workforce to to kind of to care especially for children at home like on a on a what is like literally the, a basic income i imagine that might have a negative effect on on the wages for like for paid care like in a in a workplace whereas the wages for housework model kind of said this work is so important that you we literally couldn't pay people enough to do it it's like yeah. I think Rosa said it's like you know people should be paid like a billion pounds to feed yeah. like yeah. their baby one spoonful it's like mm. um whereas I think UBI would have like completely the reverse effect like really you know entrenching the fact that it is women that do this work yeah. and and devaluing it it's something that can be done on the most basic wage mm. and I guess in that way UBI can be seen as a way to allow the state from withdrawing the withdrawing from providing public mm. services yeah so if we think about um let's say a nursery key worker they the workforce in terms of childcare tends to be women and it tends to be very low paid work if there were a ubi would many women withdraw from the labor market entirely no longer put their children into nursery and care for their children at home and then basically allow the state to say, well, all of these women are withdrawing from work to care for their children mm. at home because we know how expensive childcare is in Britain today. And would that then give the state the opportunity to say, OK, cool, we're not doing this anymore. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think that's, that's you know, that's this kind of feeds into what you how you. Opens pretty much the first question, really, which is that there seems to be such a wide variety of approaches to what UBI means, right? You know, and it's interesting that you say, talking about one of the examples that was successful, more successful, whatever, you know, that seems to have had a more po positive impact, seems to have been one where workers themselves had had ownership over the, the way that it was implemented, the way that it was used. And I, 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 that's quite telling, isn't it, really, that... Um, that where people have had more control over it rather than it being a state-led model I don't know mm. well in terms of like who provides it what's really interesting at the moment is that lots of Silicon Valley bigwigs are super interested yeah. in it yeah. and what's also really interesting is that it's being implemented a lot in the in the global south mm. but not called UBI but called unconditional cash transfers and um, so in parts of Kenya, um, in parts of Malawi, um, organisations with big funders like Google are going in and saying, well, what we're going to do is 
give unconditional cash payments to people in certain villages where there is very little um, in terms of state provision. And actually that leads to the question of what are the sort of power dynamics here? Yeah. To what extent is this a neo-colonial mm. thing in yeah. the sense that we're not supporting the development of state provided welfare, but we've got um, NGOs backed by big business providing small cash payments that enable people to survive, to eke out a living, but then ultimately people are encouraged to set up small businesses, for example. So mm. it leads to the question of, you know, who is the fund owned, what their intentions are. Um, and yeah, it, there's a new trial that's going to be set up in the US, for example, that again, it's called Y Combinator, and again, has got a lot of backing from big Silicon Valley companies. And I think that has real um, interesting implications for the transformation of the state, mm. the role of big tech companies and how we see the welfare state changing in the future. I'm not going to lie to you, that instantly makes me dislike it. As soon as I see people from Google and uh, with Elon Musk saying how great yeah. UBI is, I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> Straight away, this is not my bag. <laughs> He's not someone I really want to be seen as on the same side of. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and also makes it inherently suspicious, right? Yeah. Because yeah. these people... Would... Yeah. generally don't act in the common good i don't mean to sound like the grumpy socialist in the corner <laughs> but <laughs> that billionaire over there yeah. i think he might be up to something <laughs> are you saying that billionaires don't do good things i'm waiting for one to sweep me off my feet <laughs> <laughs> um maybe that's a good opportunity because we, we are moving into the area of, of talking about criticisms what do you mean moving into uh, yeah <laughs> so i i would like actually to be so i think you outlined a lot of really concrete and practical um, problems that arise from where it has been tried and implemented. Some mm -hmm. successes, but a lot of problems. It might be useful to go back to the, the Alaska example, because I think that's a good way of asking mm -hmm. this question. So like you mentioned, Alaska has this payment system yep. that's based on oil revenues. Now that is a, many people have criticized that payment system as basically a bribe a system of bribery because the extraction of that oil is a, a massive ecological cost and is essentially a way of paying off local communities and the oil companies that are using that resource and using that land once that resource has been spent they're going to go. I mean, even Simpsons picked up on that in their film, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Give them like, here's five hundred dollars. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. I forgot about that. Actually. <laughs> so, and I think that brings out maybe an ecological question that comes from UBI. That UBI is a system of consumption. It's about buying things, right? Oh. And everyone buying potentially more things. And actually, is there a model that exists that acknowledges the very finite resources that are available? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, money, money, money as a way of organizing social goods is is not good for the environment. Money is premised on the idea that you can potentially, well, very practically acquire if infinite amount of money, more money than you could ever buy for all the things mm -hmm. in the world. That it's possible to acquire you know social value to the point that n there are actually no more things to buy so if that's the case and we're just kind of slushing consumption of money into the economy then is there any ecological response to this yeah okay that's a really good question um before i properly answer it there's something that you said that sort of went ping in my head that i'm gonna touch on mm -hmm. so in alaska it's kind of hush money, right? So like mm -hmm. it's given to everyone on the condition that people say, okay, we're not gonna call out the fact that this is coming from oil. And that comes brings us back to the question of how universal is universal basic income ever gonna be? Like what are the implicit and explicit conditionalities of it? So in the Alaskan example, we can say, well, it's a coercive thing because you're given a thousand um, dollars a year um, that you know is coming from oil revenue. And because you want to receive this money, you're less likely to call out the ecological impact. So I think that raises a question of what are 
the conditionalities of UBI. Yeah. Um, and the ecological question is really interesting. So there are arguments that say, well, actually, in a global economy where as a result of automation, for example, there is less employment to go around, a generous UBI will give people the opportunity to withdraw from the labour market and therefore have positive ecological outcomes. But ultimately, the UBI, UBI um, is based on a market mechanism. Yeah. And as long as you're proposing a system that's based on a market mechanism, you're not decoupling anything from capitalist growth. And if you're to avert ecological disaster, well, then you need to be thinking, well, how do we slow down capitalist growth? UBI is based on consumption, right? Mm, yeah. Because it's a market mechanism, you've got to buy the stuff, you've got to keep consuming. Um, so I think we can challenge UBI in that way. And I think there are some interesting um, alternative proposals that um, try to sort of deal with the ecological question a bit more. So, for example, the four day week argument or um, another sort of related area, the idea of universal basic services. So if the state, for example, takes on the responsibility for providing welfare but on a much bigger scale well sustainability can be built in and the slow growth model can be built in better yeah i mean i think i, I should clarify that i'm not making the point as a lot of no not a lot that's unfair but some some environmental campaigners have this idea that we should aim to reduce consumption mm -hmm. and i'm not necessarily saying that in a blanket way mm -hmm. obviously we need to address the levels of poverty that exist in our society. Yeah. And for many people, that means consuming more. But if the way that you're going to address inequality is by giving everyone additional purchasing power, then that seems to be putting a model, a system that uses mm. resources very badly into overdrive. Yeah. And that seems like a bad way of dealing with the very finite yeah. and precious things that yeah. we have on this planet. Yeah. Um, again, sorry, it's just occurred to me on on the whole green thing. The UK Green Party is very big on UBI. UBI. So Caroline Lucas said that it's an exciting idea because it will help us form a clearer idea of what constitutes welfare, good work, human flourishing and help us towards a balanced economy, which acknowledges what is truly productive in its broader sense. I that can is... tell by the accent that you gave it that you take it really seriously. Yeah, I take it really seriously. I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't have a position at all. Yeah. I'm very neutral on the topic of UBI. I have no, uh, no strong opinions on it whatsoever. But what's really interesting in what Caroline Lucas says here is like, well, what kind of UBI system are you envisaging? Like, yeah. is it so generous as to allow you to completely reimagine what work is? And that brings us to the thing of like, well, can we reimagine what work and the good life and human flourishing is outside of something that's got a monetary value to begin with? It's kind of like putting the horse before the cart saying, well, UBI will help us rethink what good work and human flourishing is. But it's like, well, why do we need to value what a good life is in order to think about what a good life is? Maybe what, what she mean? means is everyone will then have enough money for organic hummus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a constituency I mean, pitch, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. She's talking to her base. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> in Brighton will be able to afford organic hummus. So now that Whole Foods has been bought up by Amazon, I'm really big on this. So if we could all just go shopping at Whole Foods to buy some really, really nice quinoa. Universal basic quinoa. That is what I demand. I think it's pronounced quinoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uncultured. How do you even not know that it's quinoa? See, <laughs> um, this this brings us uh, well to the second question, which I it it's an economic question, but I think it actually I I don't think it's necessarily too complex. I'm a little bit cautious about bringing in economic theory, but in essence, um, well, Marx argues that's the first reference oh, for those who can tell. Oh, oh, drink. Theory broke. Theory broke. Theory broke. <laughs> so, so Marx argues, and it could be that the Marx's conception, Marx's understanding here of the labour market is too simplistic. <gasps> writing, writing, Heresy. writing, writing of the beginnings of capitalism. 
things have developed somewhat since then. But his argument is that unemployment plays a very important function in regulating wages and keeping the labour market working. The idea that any boss can make you unemployed at any time and unemployed in his time meant destitution, but in our time means various not very nice harsh mm -hmm. conditions and impoverishment. The fact that that happens means there's an incentive to accept a lower pay. That we, we are not going to say to our bosses, pay us as much as you possibly can because they can always turn around and go, you're fired and then you're screwed, right? Mm -hmm. So if that is true, that seems to suggest that UBI would kind of break that system. Yeah. So that's my first question is, does is that correct? Does it break that system? And my second related question is, if it breaks that system, why don't we just break that system anyway? Ooh, like oh. if, if if capital if capitalism is a, is a poor way of organising our society, organising labour, organising social goods, then why use this very complicated policy to do that? Why not just actually say, well, actually, this system isn't working, and and we need a better way of organizing a human economy okay. that's just so crazy this is okay so this is quite a big question so forgive me if what i end up doing is just a massive word vomit <laughs> um, and stop me if it gets a bit too word vomity <laughs> and be like okay this is time to reframe the question and refocus it so uh, <laughs> so we like in terms of the actual trials that have been done we don't have very much evidence on the work and labour market effects of a national UBI scheme. Yeah. So a lot of this is theoretical. Mm. So the first argument is that UBI could unbind the coercive aspect of wage labour. That's quite theory, bro. Basically, de-link work from your wages, right? Yeah. So a UBI scheme could transform the relationship between labour and capital. Labour is decommodified. De so in this way, for example, and this is quite an exciting, positive thing of UBI, I did it. Yeah. Um, so you could see UBI as a universal strike fund, right? Yeah. So like in the case of industrial action, all the workers can be like, well, we're not working. We've got our UBI, we can survive. Yeah. But what we don't talk about when we think about this is, well, um, bargaining power and the ability of the workers to go on strike. What if the condition of a UBI is that you can't go on strike whilst you're receiving UBI. Mm. Um, so it so you know what if the conditionality means that it can't be a universal strike fund? And I guess this again comes back to the thing of UBI means lots of different things to different people. But if UBI was high enough to decommodify labour, so if to give people the option to not work, um, it it could um, it could be great. Sorry, hang on, what did I say? If, if, <laughs> let's try that again. If UBI was high enough to give people the option to not work, great. But if it's not high enough to give people the option to not work, then it could push wages down. Mm. So basically what it means is that it could exacerbate poor paying conditions. So the argument here is actually... UBI could increase precarious work. So if you're getting just a little bit on top of your shit pay from Deliveroo, mm. then actually what you're doing is providing a buffer that normalizes precarious employment, right? Yeah, um, so it becomes normal to be out of work yeah. on a regular basis because you can just go back to UBI yeah. and then just do a job, go back to UBI. Yeah, legitimizes yeah. gig economy. And yeah. that's the logic of universal yeah. credit as well. So like basically UBI, might just be a subsidy to business that allows them to pay low wages and ensure that the gig economy ensure that insecure work becomes something that's really normal um so yeah so basically like we end up with two different scenarios so if ubi increases the supply of labor for in insecure jobs then it would have an adverse impact on wages and the conditions of employment and UBI would make it easier to hire to shit conditions. Or UBI could give, like a really generous UBI, could give workers the power to turn down exploitative work and transform the worker-employer relationship. And again, this comes back to who's funding it, who's got the control, and the question of, well, actually, is demanding a UBI the most uh, effective way that unionists can be mm. Um, campaigning for change. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Because it, 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 
it really depends on who's making the argument because those people who are in favour of UBI, they do they do put that argument forward. You know, you see it. I've seen it in a in a few things discussing UBI that I, you know I've seen is where people say, well, you know, I, if everyone's getting a thousand pounds a month, why would anyone take a job sweeping a street or cleaning a sewer or whatever? And the people who are in favour of UBI will then say as a counter to that, well, it's fine because UBI will help people say, well, you need to improve this job. If you want someone to work it, you need to make mm-hmm. it worthwhile. So, again, it does come down to who's who's talking about UBI. Yeah. Is it is it someone who's in favour of it or someone who's not? Um, and I, I, I found one of, the, one of the best criticisms of it was um, uh, Douglas Rushkoff who was really interesting because he started out as someone who was in favour of UBI and his starting position was very much UBI is great, UBI is fantastic, it's going to allow for people freedom to do what they want, blah, blah, blah. And then he quickly realised, and I think partly for the same criticism that we just raised earlier, about the number of sort of big wig tech giants who were talking in favour of it, I think he quickly realised... Actually, there's a reason these people are in favour of it. It's because it, it, like we were just saying, legitimises that gig economy. Yeah. It makes it much easier to justifiably say, well, I don't need to pay you the rest of the time. I can just pay you for this one tiny job and here's 20 quid and off you go. Because don't worry, you've got a UBI. Yeah. And I guess what's really significant to this is that ultimately UBI puts faith in the market mechanism, right? Yeah. It, yeah. it assumes that the market is fair. So it says the invisible hand of the market is fair in deciding how goods and services are valued. Yeah. So it's just entrenching yeah. a model of, yeah. well, capitalism. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it's really funny because the same criticisms would, you know, personally that I would have for this, I would also have the same critique for tax credits. I would have exactly the same critique because all it does is it just bankrolls big business to pay people less money and it gives that same excuse you know so i think if we're if we're looking for a a, a real world example of of something similar to ubi to build criticisms off the backs of the back of tax credits is a fantastic example because all you have to do is look at the low pay in supermarkets in fast food and how thousands of people millions of people around the uk have to rely on a system of tax credits which justifies paying people miles below a living wage and companies use that as well they're fine because they get money off the government as well so yeah Mm. so i'm just going to put my soapbox away now i think (laughs) what's what's also really significant just off that is that UBI is individual mm, like yeah. just as tax credits are individual yeah. just as well actually side beef universal credit is paid per household which is deeply sexist oh, because yeah. who pockets the household payment what does this mean for women but that's a side note but ultimately UBI is an individual payment yeah. it individualizes social responsibility mm. and as a unionist should we be campaign and as unionists should we be campaigning for something that is individualized or should we be thinking actually we need to collectivize we need to pursue collective action and we need to collectivize social welfare um so i think that distinction is really important and it really helps focus those arguments around the economy um okay so let's move on to our last question which we've We've talked about a few times, but maybe it's good to address it a bit more head on. In all models of UBI, you can be correct me. My understanding, if I'm wrong, correct me. My understanding is that all models of UBI, the payments flow through the state, the state administered. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. (laughs) So does UBI uh, massively increase the power of the state? And should that be a worrying feature of it? in terms of a leftist perspective? Okay, that's a really, really interesting question. First of all, it's not always led by the state. Um, So like I said, um, in parts of the global south, it's administered by NGOs or by philanthropists. Um, In the US, the Y Combinator trial is supported by big business. Um, Previous trials have involved um, the state. So the and the trial I mentioned in India was co-funded by UNICEF, the state, and then supported by a trade union. 
So there's a lot of different ways to fund it. But the state question, I think, is the most interesting. And what's really significant for this, I think, is that um, our friends at the Adam Smith Institute, some people are mega into UBI. Why? Because it says, well, actually, it doesn't um, give the state more to do. It doesn't give the state power. It allows the state to not have to deal with any kind of social welfare, because if there's a UBI payment, the state can go, oh, well, hands up. We're giving you this cash. It's your choice what you do with it. You got you go and buy services on the market. So you go pay for your own health care. You go pay for your own child care. You go pay for your own education. So lots of right wing advocates of UBI will say, well, actually, what it does is it takes the involvement of the state away. It reduces the nanny state kind of vibe. Um, there's also the thing of, well, if the UBI idea replaces the welfare state model as we have it in Britain today, that it reduces administrative costs because you're no longer assessing people and you're no longer saying, well, you need to be means tested. You are this disabled. You're not this disabled. Are you actually fit for work, etc.? It eliminates all of that. So it's cheaper to administer. But again, we come back to the point I was making earlier of, well, will the state still need to combine a UBI payment with means tested top ups? So in that sense, it could reduce the involvement of the state. Um, but then coming back to this uh, argument that I made before about when the state is the one making the UBI payments, let's say it says, well, if you're receiving UBI, you cannot go on strike. Then UBI becomes incredibly coercive. And like the argument around the Alaska Permanent Dividend Fund, it's hush money to be like, OK, we're going to accept the fact that um, we're playing a big part in climate disaster. Mm -hmm. So I think the arguments around the state are complex, depending on what kind of model it is. Again, fundamentally, it comes back to the fact that there's no one way of doing or conceiving of UBI. It's yeah. a massive patchwork. Um, and I think that's a really big misconception that people have when they talk about it. Chris only asked that question because he hates the state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does it to annoy me? <laughs> I do it to annoy you. Yeah, you, do, yeah. <laughs> you just you don't even believe it. You, you just do, do it to wind me up. You do, you do. You actually love the state. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the fact that all your well thought out criticisms mm. of UBI mm. are just from like an old school Keynesian Keynesian perspective. Yeah, where we just like know, bring back the we employment bureau, more <laughs> state. <laughs> the yeah. labour exchange. Yeah. Do you know what? It would be fine if they still had those little pin boards with job cards on. <laughs> then everything would be fine. It just, do you know what? It's all too modern for me. Do you know what the problem is? When they invented computers, that's when it all went downhill. <laughs> I'm just going to go off to the working men's club and smoke a cigar. <laughs> Bring back working men's clubs. No, no, working men's clubs are cool. Um, yeah. But no, I think I think you have an interesting point there. Like, mm. the you know, the global economy has changed. We're not yeah. going to go back to this sort of post-war settlement. Mm. But what good things can we take from the post-war settlement in terms of state mm. welfare provision? And how can we make this relevant to the yeah. contemporary moment? Yeah. So it's like, well... We're not necessarily going to be aiming for a full employment model in the future. Maybe you are. It's up to you. It's your your you know your political vision. But <laughs> but like let's say we're not going for like a full employment future society mm. under a sort of social democratic or let's say Corbynist government. But you could say, well, let's think about other labour leaders how... are available. <laughs> <laughs> let's think about like how to rethink the welfare state. Let's think about how to rethink public services. How can we revitalise them? What what role is the state going to have in the future? Yeah. How um how close were you to cutting up your Labour Party card when he declared a national climate emergency? <laughs> I, I was furious. I said, Chris, are you why isn't the position be... of build more factories? We should build more factories. I can't write the environment too, Chris. Oh. I just like factories. So like... Chris, when are you going to be superbluing yourself to stuff? <laughs> <laughs> have you have you have, have you stockpiled your super glue? I was um that was most of my twenties. I've definitely <laughs> done that. I've had my super glue years. <laughs> I just uh yeah. 
I super glue myself to union organizing. <laughs> so now, no, you super glue yourself to me so you can irritate me. <laughs> um, I was going to say, speaking of super gluing ourselves to things, but it was a dead end. But I said it anyway. <laughs> so here we are. Um, we have kind of got onto the topic vaguely, I guess, of um, how we might organize around uh, demands for UBI. Um, can you talk a bit about what the sort of practical application um, of demand of UBI demands might be for kind of everyday organizing? And are there workers that it might be like more relevant to or, or less relevant for like that organizing around that kind of around a demand for UBI? Um, well, I mean, I think my sort of argument is that UBI is an individualist solution to a shared set of problems, right? So I don't personally think that it's something that unionists should be uh, putting their effort into. Um, ultimately, UBI supports consumer capitalism. It helps people to access more consumption. So I think the questions we need to think about as unionists is, well, moving beyond UBI, moving beyond individualist solutions to collective problems, what are we going to do, right? And I think that a big part, maybe, maybe, um, of why UBI has been so beguiling on the left is because there's a, still a lot of, like, fear on the left mm. of, like, what are we going to do? There's still a lot of, like, um, fear of taking on big action and putting forward big ideas. And I think what we need to be thinking about are the wider, bigger questions that go beyond what are sticking plasters, effectively, policy sticking plasters. So I think in a period of you know declining union membership, we need to be asking the question of how do unions grow their membership under neoliberalism? How do we organise in precarious workplaces? You know, we, we were just joking a second ago there about the fact that the post-World post War settlement has gone. Well, our understandings of unions have had to change as well, but we're still playing catch up with the sort of post-Second World War idea of the union and the kind of workplaces that we're seeing now. So I guess it's the question of, well, how do we organise in precarious workplaces? And fundamentally, how unionists transform work in a neoliberal age. So I think moving away from, like I said, sticking plasters, policy sticking plasters like UBI, we need to be thinking about transforming neoliberalism, fighting it and thinking sort of bigger ideas. Um, and I guess, yeah, sorry, go on. You yeah, I was going to say, I was gonna say, you know, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, it's, it is, it, it does feel like those on the left that are grabbing for this idea of UBI are just desperate for a solution mm, <laughs> you know trying yeah. trying to get the head round ideas of automation ideas of precarious work and thinking oh this might solve it this might solve it mm, mm. well sec secular unemployment as well yeah. which doesn't yeah. isn't necessarily relate to unemployment uh, sorry to automation but you mean non-religious unemployment <laughs> <laughs> was it economic term? oh okay sorry <laughs> Um, I should I should clarify that you are, you are correct to put um, me on that. Uh, um, you know, if you're not as well versed in Marxist <laughs> economics as I am, I should clarify you. You're correct, very correct to uh, check me on that. So, what I mean is per permanent unemployment. Sorry. So, the idea that um, and actually, I well, prior to the podcast, I know we talked about this. Maybe it's useful to talk about it now. But the idea that maybe there's really not that many more jobs left to do, mm. even even with automation. I know you, you said before, Ed, that you thought that capitalism kind of creates jobs. Even so, I, I think there may be concrete limits that we may, we may run into in terms of the kind of mass work that early and in developing capitalism mm. provided to people. Yeah, I think... So it, it's a tricky one. Like it's it's a bit like gazing into a crystal ball, yeah. right? We we don't know what the impacts of automation are going to be, and loads of people say, "Oh well, this is what's going to happen, and that's what's going to happen." But I guess if we move beyond the speculation, we can look at like historical experiences, and you know, let's say 
transformation as a result of the Fordist model. Well, it didn't lead to the reduction of work, even though people at the time were being like, oh, we're never going to have to work again. More <laughs> jobs were created. And, you know, even today when we're saying, oh, well, we've got AI. Oh, isn't AI going to change everything? Well, think of all the people who are employed in tech mm. um, and think of all the people who are now employed in IT related services. So I think, yes, you may have a point. I may be utterly wrong about this, but as long as I think my argument is, as long as we have a capitalist system, there will always be job creation. Like there will always be shit jobs that are created in order to support, let's say the Facebook people or the Google people. Mm. Um, and I don't know that's not a particularly sophisticated argument, but ultimately I think if we look at the long durée of capitalism, technological innovation hasn't necessarily led to people working less hours just look at the majority of us today like we are working longer hours than we ever have before but we've got all of these like technological solutions to things well surely I shouldn't be working at all then but here I am going to an office every day and sitting at a desk that's the kind of work that people wouldn't have envisaged a woman doing for example mm. 80 years ago so I think the automation question is a tricky one. And I think that although UBI is often like pegged as a solution to automation, I don't think it's necessarily particularly well thought through. I think that there's a lot of like, oh my God, automation is coming. What are we going to mm. do? Yeah. Like panic around it, but not necessarily thinking about the underlying economic system. And I think coming back to sort of like the union perspective stuff, like the question that arises from that is what's the future for us as unionists um so like thinking about what kind of relationship do we as unionists envisage between the state and the worker in the future like in a more techie future what kind of world of work do we envisage are we envisaging a post world post work world where we're using the benefits of technology to bring this about or are we thinking well work is a good thing like these are all questions that need to be thought through i think yeah and and totally, i mean it, and and the reality is that we're also talking about a social democratic policy as well because we are i mean that that is the position of uh, left-wing Democrats in the States, that's the position of the Labour Party here, but instead of it being this post-war deal, we're talking about the Green New Deal, aren't we? You know, mm. that is, yeah. That's the policy focus now is we will create all these new jobs through dealing with environmental crisis. Mm. It's almost like it's almost like there's a new way of creating jobs has been fathomed up, and that is fighting an environmental disaster. Yeah. But then, obviously, you just come out to the same problem again. Yeah. But ultimately, that leads us to a Marxist critique, drink, that, um, you know, that ultimately capitalism is sick, is circular. Circular? Circular? Circular, what? yeah. Cyclical? Yeah, cool. Circular? Has, 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 pe has periodic problems? Is that what yeah, we're yeah. Talking? And it has crisis. Yeah. Has, yeah. You know, will ultimately always lead to crisis, right? It got crisis. It got yeah. crisis. <laughs> which, which actually bring, brings it on to... brings brings well brings to an area that I, I wanted to address maybe in the sense that I think we could all we could definitely all accept that capitalism has has crises in 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 periods of history the the untested theory is that there is a final and decisive crisis mm. that breaks the system yeah. now there are numerous theories or predictions as to well, number one, is that going to happen? That's an open question mark. But also, if it was to happen, then what is the thing that breaks the system? Is it the dependency of the system on this, the, on labourers, mm. the fact that it runs on the fact that of on impoverishment and exploitation, mm. that those people decide that they don't want to do that anymore, and that breaks the system? That's one liver. Is is it a crisis of profitability, which we see hints of in the financial crisis, that actually? Um, the, there's a point that almost the system itself drives itself into a point of crisis. Mm -hmm. that there's too much money, there's too many goods. It reaches a point where profitability, the very reason the system exists becomes impossible. Or, and this is again, it, it, it's again, it's completely speculative, 
but can there be a crisis of employment? That one of the tendencies of capitalism from its very beginnings has to be to replace human beings with machines. Mm. And, and yeah, Marx drink. <laughs> saw that, saw that, saw that in the in the very early developments of capital. There's, there's chapters in Capital in which he talks very specifically about the introduction of machines yeah. um, and the replacement of labourers and how that you know ha- labour by hand is is, is replaced by material yeah. objects. Yeah. This then creates later problems with production of profit, yeah. but also does it create a problem of employability? Because ultimately, if you replace everyone with machines. Then the system breaks as well. It's whether it's those fine. it's whether those th- three things are fi- on ecological. I suppose is another question which mm. Marx didn't write about, but we are aware of now mm. that actually capitalism as a system runs on resources, and even those resources expend. Mm. That's it. And totally, that is that's one of the that's one of the ecological criticisms of UBI, right? Is is that by driving everyone towards machine based ways of doing things, actually that's a more resource intensive, is a more environmentally damaging way of production, and ultimately creates it exacerbates environmental disaster. So are you saying we need to go to the forest and whittle some spoons? <gasps> yes. <laughs> Can we all live in a forest? <laughs> But it is interesting because that, like, obviously the places where the places that have the resources that we'll need for for that kind of future, like, are not here. It's in the global south, and it's like, yeah. what happens to those places? Like, you know, where we're like taking out of the earth these, you know, who's doing that work? Uh, what impact is it having in those places? And then what happens to those people when they need to leave because, like, we've rendered their like home uninhabitable? Um, you know the the question of like citizenship and UBI is an interesting one and like if we think if we're thinking about the future and the inevitable like massive climate climate migrant crisis it would feel quite strange to me to be in a union branch like organizing for UBI without like a very a different um without a very different like attitude towards like migrants and who gets who gets to get things from the state like you know in the, in our union in the IWW you know there are at the moment because of organizing with Deliveroo and new breeds workers we yeah, probably have we're probably like in touch with loads of undocumented workers it would feel like very uncomfortable to, for me to like to be organizing around um around UBI when I couldn't be at all sure even with you know a Corbyn government that those people would have access to it. Mm. I think this is a really really important point um, and I'm glad that you've raised it because we haven't talked about it yet and yeah massively important point. Um, Let's not for a moment pretend that a Corbyn government is going to be migrant friendly (laughs) and is going to be anti-racist like we live within a racist system a slightly better government is not going to challenge those inherent racisms but there are sort of two um interlinking points that you touched on Lydia that I think would be really useful for us to talk about the first is what do we mean by the universal and universal basic income so one um academic who writes I think he's dead now some dead white man, or maybe <laughs> a live white man, very old white man, if not dead white man. Right. Right. <laughs> <Jesus. Right. laughs> um, called Atkinson basically argues that actually UBI should be a participation income. So you need to be participating in society. And what he means by that is that you need to be ordinarily resident and you need to be contributing. So whether uh, care work, paid work or voluntary work. So that automatically sets up an exclusion. And then when we're looking at, let's say, how racist um, migration policy is in Britain today, like if we were to have a UBI system in this country, I'm assuming, um, regardless of whether it's a Labour government or a Conservative government or any other government under the system that we would have we have now would be saying, oh, yeah. Um, people seeking asylum should have right to receive a UBI or people who with refugee status should have the right to receive UBI, given the fact that the system that we have at the moment denies people seeking asylum and denies 
refugees, even with status, from accessing any um, mainstream welfare benefits at all in the case of um, asylum seekers and mainstream welfare benefits only under certain cases for people with refugee status. So that's a really, really important point. Um, what do we mean by the universality and how would UBI that's controlled by the state be um, operationalized in such a way as to divide um, and exclude. And I think there are some interesting side thoughts that can be had there about like a, a syndicalized or localized UBI kind of approach where decisions are made in very small scales. But that's beside the point. I think the second thing that you mentioned, Lydia, was looking at UBI within a global context. And there are lots of much wider political economy implications here. So let's think of UBI in one country um, under a broadly social democratic system in that country. Well, let's say um, Britain, with its generous UBI scheme that's enough for people to live off, funded um, that UBI through higher levels of corporate taxation. Those big businesses would leave. They'd go elsewhere. What's the impact of that? Again, in a globalised economy, what would the implications of UBI in one country mean globally? What would the impacts of UBI have on global trade? Um, and I think this hasn't been thought through at all. Like there's very little literature that I know of. There may be lots that I haven't come across. I don't know. But there hasn't been much thought about this. And in the globalised economy, it's really interesting that these conversations aren't being had in terms of um, a policy intervention that's had a lot of take up and has got a lot of really like passionate advocates. Um, yeah. And it, and it is, it is entirely relevant. I, you know, I just had to double check them, but I, I thought I'd remember this, you know, ultimately this, this isn't something that's going to go away anytime soon either because the Labour Party and I've, saying in the next manifesto that there will be a uh, promise to put in a UBI um, uh, trial in the UK so, in, their next, in their next manifesto. So, so um, there's some funding that's been given to yeah. some local... Same John McDonald, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, so John McDonald has shown a lot of interest in it and there's been some funding given to... Oh, it was a re it's a really small amount of funding, actually, um, been given to some local authorities in Scotland to think about trialing UBI <laughs> and I can't remember exactly what it was I will look it up but I think it was something like 200,000 yeah. pounds to four local authorities in Scotland to think wow. about trialing yeah no 250,000 pounds I just looked it up so um, they get some nice vinyl banners <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I mean go figure what they're gonna do um yeah, so it, oh, here we go. In 2017, the Scottish government provided £250,000 to explore the feasibility of a U, feasibility study of oh, a UBI yeah. trial in four Scottish local Jeez. authorities. Um, and they're expected to submit a business case and a proposed model for consideration. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. I think um, it's interesting that... because. Um, obviously the UBI's talked a lot about on the left anyway as um as like the key to reducing the number of hours that we work um but something that seems that's been quite interesting to me is that the the demand for UBI at least until like very recently has gained a lot more traction than like calls for a four day week for example like I wonder if is it do you think it's the case maybe that it's uh the UBI seems like a more straightforward ask of the state. And, you know, with a Corbyn-led Labour Party, it seems like something that you could maybe ask for and maybe get, whereas a f like something like a four-day working week or a reduced working week is obviously something that needs to be organised for. It's, like, harder to see how the state can, like, intervene and, and give that to us. Like, do you think... Uh, like, what what do you think? Like, do you think that maybe that kind of... The, the kind of the the Corbyn the sort of a left notionally left led Labour government uh, the prospect of that has kind of played into how much traction it's got. Yeah, I think I think this comes back to those earlier points about like what do we envisage, what do we want, what change do we want to bring about, um, and 
I do think that UBI is an easier thing to go for because it fits in so well with um, systems that we already have. Um, mm. And something with a specific monetary value is a lot easier to argue for than, let's say, um, uh, campaigning for a four day week. Yeah. And I think maybe this could like segue us on to like what alternatives within the social democratic um, system can we think of? So um, one thing would be a shorter working week. Mm. Another thing to think about could be a jobs guarantee system where, um, you know, your job is guaranteed on a work share model, for example. Or another thing could be um looking at the provision of universal basic services as an alternative. Mm. I think yeah, Lydia's point is exactly right, because it is, it is just an absolute, uh, absolute lack of confidence in the mm. ability of, of organised labour to yeah. dramatically change the world around us. You know, yeah. for us to, to make dramatic changes. Instead, we should just fiddle with the welfare system. Mm. You know, yeah. I, we can call you can call UBI as radical as you like. You know, for my money, you can describe it as a radical idea as you like, but ultimately, it is a fancied up it is a fancied up welfare system. Mm. It is mm. it is nothing it is nothing better than that. Yeah. And if that is the if that is the absolute limit of our imagination of what we can achieve, then we should be really concerned about that. Yeah. Because we definitely can do better than we should pay more welfare and everyone should get it. Yeah, Yeah, totally. (laughs) And if we are going to like have that sort of narrowness of imagination, then why aren't we saying, well, let's reform the existing welfare benefit system. Let's reform income support. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of universal credit. Like it's a really funny one. Like the Mm -hmm. fact that that's the most radical that people can yeah. consider themselves being without first thinking about, well, what really terrible policy um, decision <laughs> that's leading to people to go hungry yeah. and to become homeless. Why aren't we tackling yeah. that rather than putting our weight behind a, another yeah. welfare mm. benefit policy intervention? And I think, again, what's really important there as well, actually, how much are we listening to people who are currently receiving um welfare support no, <laughs> um, and it's like yeah. well who who are the who are the proponents and the advocates of ubi and how much are they talking to people who receive welfare state support beyond let's say nhs or education services yeah. i think it's uh it's quite interesting that i mean the thing that everybody the the point at which i noticed everyone started talking about this was the um the book what was it was it demand the future I always call it a totally like I always get the title mixed up it's the Alex Williams book with it with that automation and like it's just that not only are they kind of making this proposal which is a kind of you know as we've said like seems like a really it seems just like wholly inadequate um and like not transformative in any way like they also in in the process of doing it just uh you know slag off organizing like yeah. that the whole like the folk politics thing at the start of that book is like I actually think like relatively reprehensible <laughs> like you know the kind of mischaracterization <laughs> I mean we all know people that are like doing annoying like useless stuff but, like the idea that most people that are doing <laughs> political organizing are doing like organizing around the slow food movement is that a thing i think they made it up it's, <laughs> it's bullshit like you know it's a lot of, uh, messages now <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from people in bristol <laughs> they're the only people doing involved in the slow food our bike co-ops now this <laughs> <laughs> sorry bristol i'm not sorry um yeah just i found yeah i just i could see why people were quite taken in by that by those that uh, the argument of that book but when you reflect on it it is like we've discussed yeah just like inadequate and also like dangerously dismissive of um of organizing <laughs> like yeah you know basically says it's not going to get you anywhere I mean, so it's depressing yeah 
I think I, I definitely share those sentiments in a, in a way, I think. Well, the organizer is not going to get you anywhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no, in the sense that I think a lot of the spirit behind this is is a way of bypassing or even just like you say, undermining organizing. Yeah. Um, I, I do feel a hint of optimism because I remember the conversations I was having with Labour Party members mm -hmm. 15 or 20 years ago yeah. in which they were raving about academization and PFI initiatives mm -hmm. and going, this is the future of socialism. We'll just slush like private money into services yeah, and that yeah. fix everything. Yeah. So the fact that they're acknowledging the work is not great and that the yes. unemployment system is not great and it needs an, an alternative for some for some of them. The fact that some of them are acknowledging that I feel is an improvement. Yeah. But it is a kind of sense of, OK, try, come on, try harder. And I think ultimately, like those kinds of advocates of UBI seem to think it's some kind of silver bullet that's yeah. going to yeah. fix everything. Yeah. Um, we're out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for uh, for coming and talking to us about it. It's been super interesting. Mm. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No, thanks very much. It's been, I've learned loads. It's, it was really great. Um, the next Talking Shop episode, we're going to be um, talking about, um, so actually some of the things that we touched on today. So um, we're going to be talking about environmentalism and the trade union movement. Um, so yeah, so we hope to uh, see you then. I mean, <laughs> that's not the right <laughs> word, but you know I mean. it's already better than mine. That was already better than mine. <laughs> yeah, the bar is low, I think, on our sign off. <laughs> keeping it on the floor. Yeah, so uh, thanks very much. Um, don't forget to, uh, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud, you can subscribe uh, on your you know, your preferred podcast app. And you can also give us some money via Patreon. So um, if you, you can find the link to that on our uh, Facebook and our Twitter and hopefully our website, although who yeah, knows? The articles, yeah. the Under articles, the article. So because new away. syndicalist towers is not going to build itself. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel really embarrassed now because we all agreed that we were going to thank our Patreon supporters. And I... I completely forgot to look up the names of the people i'm terribly sorry about that but we very much appreciate your support and we will definitely mention you by name in the next podcast you're better but than everybody else in the meantime well, one of them is me i have to just say one of the thank you lydia me. thank you for helping to work along unfortunately uh my card expired and the most recent payment has bounced so <laughs> i'll rectify that and then i can be thanked on the next episode no, he had earmarked that 50p. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to buy the first brick with it. <laughs> I you're just going to get yourself a Freddo. I mean, uh, we could also do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Talking Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalist for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes by subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.